Aya, oh, oh, wait, wait what? No. <sighs> Welcome to Echo. Welcome back to Echo. I can't think of anything. Anyways, um, delete some files real quick. The fuck are my three operators open? Yo, be there. There we go. Okay, so let's just jump right in. I feel my teeth start to grit, so I shift my focus outside again. Still no signs of life beyond the usual distant spots of light, each coming and going down the highway around the canyon. The smoke I noticed earlier rising up near the res looks like it's billowed higher though. Despite everything, it's actually sort of nice out. The temperature's okay, with some light cloud cover that only partially veils the purple-orange hues of the dusky sky. It's the sort of night I'd usually like to spend outside on the porch, drinking tea and whittling on some balsa. Daxton's usually quiet, cooped up in his room with his fantasy shit. I don't know how I feel about the music he has playing, but it's not bad. To think, 30 miles away, Peyton's bustling with the 100,000 people all enjoying their Saturday night. Hell, back in the day, there used to be a tiny ranching community that served Echo, kept everyone fed and such. 30 miles in the other direction, you've got the res. Population keeps dwindling from that place too, no matter how much money the feds give them to live there. All the young folk just pack up and get out while they can. The rest usually don't do too hot. Finally. 65 miles to the east, you've got the Jericho Proving Grounds. I remember back when I was a tweeny little jarhead, fussing to my uncle to take me there. They only did tours twice a year, and there's a huge wait list. I'd expected there to be a giant hole in the ground the size of Echo Canyon, but there was pretty much nothing. Dust and sediment had filled it all in over the span of 75 years. Dry grass and shrubs have even sprouted on top. All that was left was just a torn up hunk of three ton cylinder that burned so hot the metal liquefied and pulled beneath it. You could walk through the site and have no idea that's where the fucking A-bomb was dropped. Well, if it weren't for the big black obele obelisk they erected up top, which now is just another spot for visitors to take photos of themselves. Man mustn't forget the past, but the past will not forget man, it reads. It reminds me of the whole push from the county to make the mine some fucking tourist spot. Just a, just a slap of plaque up there with a little blurb about all the death and shit. It'll make a great selfie spot. Traffic is traffic, right? Hell, call it haunted and you got even more weirdos coming here to exploit it. Like Chase. As I hear the background noise of muffled conversation and Daxton trying to figure out how my blender works, the present sinks in. I wonder if he's going to figure this way out before I can get to him. I look over and Daxon is putting a whole fucking apple into the blender. <laughs> Some bitch, what are you doing? Daxton looks up, struggling to keep the lid on as the apple smacks hard against the sides of the plastic container. Cut the fucking thing up first. It's not going to take a whole apple. The salamander still looks a bit dazed. I guess he's still reeling from his dream or whatever. Uh-huh. Don't just, uh-huh, me... Do you fucking slippery bitch before you break my shit. Flynn. Jenna's glaring at me from the living room. It's my shit. It's my house. Jesus, man, I'm stopping. He pulls out the lacerated apple, setting on, setting it on a paper towel while rumbling. Fish damn ass burgers and french fries, I swear. I clench my rifle harder at hearing that old A word again. Turning, I make my way down the hall. There's a window in my bedroom. I'll watch there. No one else says anything. 
at least while I'm still in earshot. I kick aside my hamper and pull open the curtains to peer outside. The view's not as good here, but I don't think I could stand being in there too much longer. I tense, feeling the brush of fur on my arm. Carl's standing next to me, some freeze-dried ice cream in his grasp. Jesus, when did he get so quiet? He doesn't say anything, which puts me in the awkward position of being the one to speak. Fat ass. I mumble. Carl holds up the ice cream, which has a weird wafer-like consistency. I told Daxton I'd give him a bunch of hens give him a bunch of hens cartons I got back at my house. Your folks won't mind? They won't notice. I could just say I ate it myself. Yeah, they wouldn't doubt that. There's a light smile on his muzzle now. Right? I blink. You're okay? Not really. All this stuff got my mind off the interview though. Just kinda wanna go home and play video games without getting shot. There's a silent pause. Chase? What he said wasn't true. Oh, I know. I let out a sharp exhale, closing my eyes for a second. I let the tip of my repeater rest against the floor. Thank you, though. For what? Defending me back at the office. Graham shakes his head dismissively. I don't think you'll see most of them besides Leo again after tomorrow, though. Like you said, none of this matters. The truth does. I guess your spring break hookup with Chase isn't going to be a long-term thing then, right? I wasn't really expecting that to be brought up. Who told him? Or was it that fucking obvious? He pulls out his phone, seeming to check to see whether my Wi-Fi is working yet. I grunt, clearing my throat. I just want to know what happened. Dude, if I was Chase, I'd just get in my car and drive back to Pueblo at this point. I don't think he's going to do that. Why? I locked his ass in the reading room. Carl's eyes widen, the ram reacting much quicker than normal without his usual pop haze. So that's where you went. I think that's a crime, man. So is murder. Dude. This is Chase you're talking about. Yeah. I look awkward, peering at the sorry state my room is at the moment. I usually keep my shit tidy, but now there's dirty laundry all over the place and everything kind of smells musky. Nowhere near as bad as Carl's, but still. I'm just gonna talk to him. No torture or anything, right? Fucking hell, Carl. Do you really think I'd do that? I'm not Leo. I was joking. He rolls his shoulders. Feels kinda like when we were kids again, with all this stuff. Yeah, I just... It's... I trail off, like my mouth is refusing to speak the words in my head. He sets his not-icy ice cream down on my nightstand, and I resist the urge to yell at him about the crumbs. Meanwhile... Daxton starts up the blender again in the other room. Man, I think I hear Carl sigh. Do you want, like, a hug or something? I look down at him, raising a brow. Do you? He shrugs, seeming a mixture of numb and trepidatious. I just don't want you to leave, dude. Not like everyone else. It takes me a moment to register the shift in conversation. After everything that's happened, that's what's bothering him the most. The fact that I said I might leave town. Man, we talked about this shit er I know, I know. I know, dude. Carl rubs out his jawn face with the base of his paws, pacing upon the carpeted floor. I just... It'd suck ass, that's all. Not in a good way, either. I fidget with my rifle, acting like I'm doing something with it while I think of what to say. You'd be alright. I don't know. Seem to be friendlying up to, with Dax. He even plays video games and does all that other nerd shit you like that I don't. You game sometimes. Yeah, only because you do. I guess. That's the point, isn't it? He scratches out his beanie, a bit of his head for picking up from the horn holes. I say nothing, just watching him go back and forth. I wish he wasn't so nervous. I wish he'd just say it. He's cool. And you're not all anxious around him? I still kinda am. You were talking about porn and shit with him within an hour of your first proper conversation. That's how you can tell you've made a good friend. I put on a smirk. If that were the case, you'd be the most popular guy in the county. Oh, fuck off, bleeder. I snirk, regardless. 
With a shift of my hips, I nudge him with my tail. Stop your treading. You're wearing out the carpet. Sorry. He stops, looking down at his hooves for a moment, then back up to me. If I stayed put, I'd probably start sticking to it. Fuck you. I smile, though I try to stifle it. I always thought us lizard folk look, look fucking creepy when we smile. We don't really have the same cutesy appeal like most furry fuckers. Like Carl. This is gonna sound really gay, but promise you won't leave, dude. The seriousness of the request makes me pause. I look into his eyes and I feel like a selfish asshole. Carl's not fucking ready for this world. He's just gonna rot here. But I never really felt right filling this whole big brother role again after what happened. Carl shifts his weight from hoof to hoof, noting my lack of response. I know I'm like a total burden, but you're not a fucking burden, huh? You keep me from losing my mind in this shithole, you know that? You're the reason I haven't left already. Carl stops shifting, seeming to be trying to wrap his head around that admission. He opens his muzzle to speak, but I cut him off. And don't fucking go off again about how you're almost 21 and you should be better on your own. Turning into an adult doesn't magically fix all the shit that fucked you up as a kid. Dude, you're not- He thins his lips, the ram looking rather awkward. I'll stay. For now. For real? That's what I just fucking said, you absolute dumbass. Next thing I know, Carl's fist is against my soft spot. I flinch back, irping instinctively, but there's no pain. Only that same, usual, tingly feeling. He's not punching me. He's poking me. The corner of Carl's lip curls upward in a sort of half-smile. He nudges me again, this time in the shoulder. I raise an inquisitive brow, thumping him back. He steps forward, wrapping his arms around my torso. I'm left standing, a little baffled at what just happened, with Carl's thick arms around my midsection. His fur is coarse. Not quite to the point that it's pricking me, but it has its weight to it. I look down at the top of his bean noggin, and it really is just like when he was a kid again. A real damn milk sop. There's no back pats with a hug. He lingers. I open my mouth to say something stupid, but I just bite my tongue. I don't draw back either. Closing my eyes, I empty my mind and just stop thinking for a moment. I lean forward, resting my chin between his horns. I get this weird sort of twisty feeling in my chest. Carl shifts again as if trying to look up. And of course, the edge of his hoof steps right on one of my toes. <sighs> I suppress a grimace just as the ram lifts his head up enough to meet me eye to eye. Sorry. Eh, it's fine. I'm tough. Hey. Jenna's voice startles us both and we pull apart. I pivot on heel to see the fox staring at us with a look I, ki I can't quite place. Surprised, amused, even a bit wry. Food's ready. She looks at both of us. Carl acts like he's checking his phone. High school me would be squeeing right now. I swear, there's something in the tap water. I open my mouth to protest, but then just let a quiet ugh. I have to will my tail not to curl in on itself. Then again, I'm pretty sure you don't drink plain water. She seems she seems to be looking up at Carl. Shit. I can practically see Carl's blush through the top of his cheeks. Flynn, when you got a minute? What? I clear my throat, putting on a more neutral expression. What do you want? I need to talk to you. Not about this. Her eyes flick back and forth between us. She's drinking in the sight like Carl Downs energy drinks. What the hell does she want to talk to me alone about? I glance down to Carl, then back. Yeah, I'm still gonna keep watch after, though. Is that what you were doing? She turns, departing as soon as she finishes speaking, not letting me get a word out. Fucking typical. I rub my hand over my face. It was just a hug. Carl's voice is quiet, but still rings defensive. <laughs> Fuck her. I'm, uh, glad you're staying, though, dude. I grunt, reaching over and squeezing the pudge on the ram's side. He grins instinctively, trying to push my hand away. I give his pectoral one last pinch before giving him a nudge out the door to my room. I guess I'm supposed to feel embarrassed right now, but I don't really. 
I'm just glad to have this loser around. Daxton will be good for Carl if I do go, but I don't want to think about that now. As I turn to leave, I look at my bed and I can't help but see him lying there. That vacant look in his eyes, and cum still splattered on his neck. Fucker was playing me the whole time. And for what? To get off? That's all it was. It's spring break and he for some reason watched enough scaly porn to want me. Consequence free, right? The sound of clinking silver in the kitchen pulls me back into the present. I straighten out my pants, waiting for my cock to fully retreat before heading back to the kitchen with my rifle. Yeah. There they all are. Carl's already poking around inside a salad bowl on the counter, glancing up at me briefly. Daxon's the only one sitting, staring at the water in his glass. I sling my rifle over my shoulder. I grab one of the salamander's cups from the cupboard and get myself what looks like an apple banana smoothie. The cup itself is labeled for some sort of convention, but the exact name of it has been worn away from many washings. As I move to get as I move to the salad, Carl nudges me. At first I think he's just being playful, but then I follow his eyes. Leo's standing by the window, with his nose practically pushed up against it. I can see the condensation from his breath murking up the glass. It's getting dark out, so he's probably just keeping watch. Still doesn't stop him from looking like a weird looking like a real weird motherfucker. TJ's looking at him too, his expression difficult to place. He's never been exactly hard to read when he's upset like this. His nervous tick always gives it away. Yet I can't tell where he looks and looks more of concern or guilty. I'm usually good at reading folks, so this is kinda of pissing me off. I take a seat next to Daxton. I'm uh a bit out of the loop here. His big blue eyes shift from person to person. Might be best if you fuck off with him for a bit. Seriously, can you explain something for once instead of being like a weird cryptic shithead? Okay, I just saw the YouTube video is done processing, so I'm gonna publish it. And okay, part 20 is now out. I can see the line, I can see lines form along Daxton's smooth forehead as he furrows his brows. His skin so tightly stretched across his body, if he makes even the slightest change of face readily visible. I don't have a clue how the furry tits get my kind confused with his. As I grunt and mutter for him to eat my shit, I can't help but wonder if I should bring him up to speed or not. I guess part of me wants as many people as possible to know what happened. I mean, fuck, that's what I've always wanted, right? These fuckers finally acting like something happened, and that our little group wasn't just little old Leo Chase TJ Carl. Wasn't just little old Leo Chase TJ Jenna Carl and I. Eventually, everybody sits to eat. There's not enough room at the kitchen island for everybody, so TJ and Jenna sit on the counter by the fridge. TJ's still not saying much. Alright, I still can't access Wi-Fi or make calls. Daxton, is it? Yep. Were we not taking shelter from Clint? We wouldn't mean to impose upon you like this, so my apologies. It's alright. He pokes out a clump of almond shavings in his salad. I just want to know what's going on. She looks to TJ, then after a quiet, affirming nod from the lynx, she responds to the salamander. When we were younger, one of our neighbors, our friend, drowned in Lake Emma. She pauses. Actually, they died in a hospital later on, but the point is, we were all there for it. It was a rather traumatizing experience, even for the older members of our sort of friend group at the time. She speaks in such a plain, even tone. She might as well be reading the directions off the back of a TV dinner. Everyone, including Daxton, looks incredibly uncomfortable. The salamander just nods in faux understanding. Oh? He digs into his cell with such focus. It's like he's trying to read a book in there. So, let's just jump right into it. She takes a big drink from her smoothie, leaving us in anticipation. I groan quietly. Flynn? Fucking what? Do you believe that Chase killed Sydney? What? Daxton looks up, letting out a little whisper of laughter, assuming we're joking. As he sees the only one la as he sees he's the only one laughing, he starts to look visibly tense. 
I didn't fucking expect her to just straight up ask and ask me this either. Well, the way I see it, either Chase is lying or TJ is. Or fuck it, maybe they both are and are covering for each other's asses. But Chase in there was spouting bullshit like a steer's rear. I point to TJ, who quickly looks away. Threw me under the bus the moment he started squealing. Chase would never lie to me like that. He lied to you all the fucking time, you not-brained bastard. Leo snarls. Do you have any non-rose-tinted memories left in that fucking thick skull of yours? I don't need to listen to nothing from someone who manipulated him for sex. I stand up, my stool falling back and hitting the floor. How goddamn dare he? Not this shit again. I didn't fucking do that. Do you really think I'm some sort of fucking rapist? You're so stupid, why don't you goddamn listen to me? Enough. TJ shifts, looking like he's about to start crying again. I'm not lying. I clutch the edge of the counter, trying to control my breathing. I slowly pull up my stool and sit, trying to ignore the strange look Leo was giving me. It kind of reminds me of those fish in the freezer. The way they stare forever when there's no more circuits firing in their tiny brains. I wonder if I'll ever love somebody enough to go full stupid in the face of facts like that. What a poor crazy idiot. That's awful. It's still word versus word with you two. And Chase fucked off once TJ told us what happened from his point of view. Which took you long enough, by the way. I hard-eye the links, but his own eyes are cast so far away from me, they might as well be in the back of his head. TJ. Jenna rubs her palm... Jenna rubs her palm the napkin, wringing it some before speaking again. Tell us about the monster you saw. Oh, come on. Jenna ignores me. Give us as many details as you can, and take as much time as you need. TJ clutches his bowl of salad in his lap with both paws, it looks like he hasn't had a bite. His eyes take on that more reflective quality they always do when the tears are starting to well. It's unnerving on a sort of primal level to see TJ tearing up like this. He's an adult, a grown-ass man, looking just like he did when he was a kid. It reminds me of how little any of us have truly grown up. Um... Like I said before, tall with burnt skin, Reddish, I guess. How tall? Like, almost seven feet? Jenna frowns. How did it move? Really fast, or not at all? It was like pictures, you know? A slideshow that was being fast-forwarded. Carl finally looks up from his hooves, the ram appearing increasingly nervous. When it, it walked through the water, the water didn't move like a wake. It just splashed out with each step. Tell me about the face again, please. Uh, okay. TJ's having such a hard time getting the word out, but Jenna doesn't stop. She looks wrapped. Three holes. Two for the eyes, one for the mouth. They weren't, like, bloody or anything. Just empty. Dark. Everyone's silent for a moment. Then, next to me, Daxton rises up to his feet. The salamander walks around to where TJ's sitting, then points to something behind him. Like this? Oh shit, I thought it was going to do something scary. He's pointing at the electrical socket? TJ turns, looks at it, then he twitches as if startled. He quickly wipes his eyes and nods. Daxton stares, slack-jawed. Leo takes a loud slurp from his smoothie. There's a dribble of the pink liquid stuck in his fur around the edge of his jowls. Guys, am I missing something here? I saw it! Saw what, Carl? That thing! Carl gestures towards the electrical outlet. I give him an incredulous look as we meet each other's ga glances for a second. Yeah? I saw a pretty nifty light switch back when I was 13. <laughs> I look to TJ didn't make me hide the truth about my friend's murder for about a decade. Shut up, dude. I blink at Carl. He stands up, still staring at the socket. When I crashed my car that night, you remember? I do. Carl didn't want to talk about it for months after it happened. I only found, about the, only found out about the truth then. 
It was after he dropped out of college. Apparently, it was way fucking past twilight, and he was drugged out of his mind. That scabies-ridden fat-ass Jeremy gave him acid in his trailer, and he had a bad trip. Carl describes some cartoon he put on. A tiger and a bird, with a tiger baking the bird alive. He mentioned how vivid everything was, how the f and how the fucking Jeremy wouldn't stop laughing. He busted out of there and drove off all Hightail-like. While making his way down Route 65, he swerved and hit a pole. The impact would have killed him if he weren't so thick-skulled. And of course, he told his dear old parents about it, and they took the blame for everything. They didn't want him to be tested when the cops showed. It wasn't until a couple months ago he told me, in his drug addled mind, he thought he had driven to Pueblo and picked up Chase. Carl claimed he was talking to him the whole ride back, telling him how college telling him how college life was going and shit. Stroking his horns, mentioning how he missed him, and wanted him to come back as a roommate. You know, all the shit Chase never actually said after Carl dropped out. The fucker barely even responded to his messages. He couldn't have sworn when he swerved off the road and struck the pole. He killed Chase, crushed somehow at impact. He wouldn't stop shaking. I made a joke that I would have helped him bury the body. I threw up later thinking about it. Yeah. The ram is looking at me now with these really big sad eyes. I never see him like this, sober and fully fucking aware of really bad shit. Usually the moment shit starts getting remotely bad, he, t he tokes till his mind melts the horrors away, as he calls them. There's none of that shit here, that's for certain. I never liked how it makes me feel. Daxton's too nerdy to know any pot dealers. This is going to sound real nuts, but that thing TJ's describing with the electrical socket face? It was chasing me that night, man. I saw it. Exactly how TJ described. That's how it moved. I thought I had outran it, but then it was in the car with me where I thought Chase was, and I hit the fucking pole, man. Where Chase was? Leo looks at Carl with raised eyebrows. I let out a puff of exasperated air. You were tripping balls on acid. I looked to the rest of the group. That's why he thought he was with Chase. Leo's expression froze. You've done acid, Carl? Yeah, er, I know how it sounds. I thought it seemed familiar earlier when TJ was describing it at City Hall. That face was just like an outlet. Daxton's nodding along with everything Carl says. Flynn, I literally was just telling you about this shit. I saw it in my dream, in the water. It's the second time I've seen it in two days. I recognize it too. Not in a dream or because of drugs though. She looks over at TJ, who appears even more frightened with the confessions from those around him. When I was younger, well, much younger, I sometimes saw it during times I was really angry or sad. It's the closest thing I've ever had to what my grandmother described as a spiritual experience. When I told her about it, she told me it sounded a lot like a Wendigo. This is really silly, guys. We just need to talk to Chase. He'll clear all of this up for us. Leo continues to eat, the one of us still doing so at this point. Daxton gawks at him. Are you for real right now, man? I'm the only one who's thinking real things right now. Yeah. The wolf scarfs down an incredibly large bite of salad. A guy like Leo probably needs to eat four meals a day with his wolf metabolism. His nose is starting to bleed too, probably crack, probably cracking from how de dehumidified I keep it in here. So, uh, despite all of us, sans you and Flynn, having had experiences with this thing, you want to completely disregard it? Leo just nods. And to be fair, I'm fucking flabbergasted by what they're saying as well. But at the same time, the coincidence of all of this is just too much. TJ's tough to read now, but I doubt the sincerity of but I don't doubt the sincerity of Carl, Jenna, or even Daxton, and that they believe what they're saying. I just want the truth. That's all I want. I sigh. I think we should talk to my aunt. Why your aunt? She's good with this sort of shit. I pause. Well, I don't know what this is that's happening, but fuck, I don't know what else to do. Leo just frowns at me. I frown back at him. You can go home if you want. 
I know it's tempting now that Chase isn't here for you to stalk. Chase will track me down like he always does. He'd be pissed if I let anything happen to you guys, though. Who knows? Maybe he's seen the Wendigo, too. Daxton side-eyes me with a baffled look. Do you have a spare gun I could borrow? Jesus, is this really what it's come to? I look at Leo for a long moment. He's been this sort of gun nut as of late, which is real strange, noting how against them he was in high school. You licensed? Yep, open carry. I know what I'm doing. That's not saying much, noting our state has the most lax weapon licensing standards in the nation. That's typical Jenna for you. Reality's going out the window, but she'll still sit there, but she'll still be there thrusting some socio-political bullsh- bullet point in the middle of it. All my shit's licensed for me, and me alone. Leo just stares at me before walking off. To your aunt's house, then. He grabs a flashlight and makes his way out to the front door. I guess we're going. Seems so. Carl and Daxton look at each other. I'm not feeling very good. If you're going to puke, do it on Dax's side of the sink. The salamander, who is already looking unnerved, so <laughs> somehow manages to frown even more. Jenna strokes the lynx's arm, muttering something that I can't quite catch. For a split second, a glimmer of a sad smile appears on his face. It diminishes quickly, but I guess I'm glad TJ's not completely broken. The group begins to head out, leaving their plates and cups on the counter. I linger a bit, catching Janet as she's wiping her paws off on a dish towel. Hey. Yeah? You wanted to tell me something? She gives me a look like she doesn't know what I'm talking about. Mm hmm? She pauses, then nods as if remembering something. I'm happy for you and Carl. Her tone is idle, her mind seemingly focused elsewhere. If he's going to explore his sexuality, it's good that it's with someone he knows and trusts, who's, you know, experienced. What? I cross my arms tightly over my chest, squinting down at her. How the fuck would you know that I'm experienced? We ain't a thing. Yes, you weren't ever much for having things in general. She looks out the window, her expression kind of like a mix of distant and troubled. Everyone's filing into the van, except Askston, trying to hold his phone to the sky, trying to get service, I guess. As I open my mouth to her butt, she holds up her paw. It's not what I wanted to talk to you about, and I suppose current matters are, she sighs, more pressing than would be appropriate to delay for this conversation. Her demeanor seems to shift, her posture not as full of that holier, holier than thou air she usually seems to hell bent on putting on. I can see Leo behind the wheel now, surely getting antsy. Yeah, Leo looks like he's about to pop a hemorrhoid already. I just wanted you to know I understand your concerns more clearly. I grunt. Yeah, well, hopefully my aunt can help me understand yours. I thumb back toward the electrical socket. Socket. Jenna looks at it, purses her lips, then scowls. I can't tell if she's just frowning at herself at this point. When all logic's gone out the fucking window, her shtick of being the rational mind here is certainly at challenge. With a small nod, she turns, heading out with the rest. I sigh, pulling back the lever on my repeater and watching the clip extend outward. I remember to load it, after all. Here's hoping I don't need it. I push it back in and head outside. Leo's quiet as he drives, occasionally checking the rearview mirror. Everyone else is pretty silent, too. It's weird being in a car with Carl and him just sitting there quietly not staring at his phone or anything. It's like he doesn't know what to look at, and is stuck pondering his own thoughts for a change. I look back at Jenna, who's monitoring her phone for any sign that the signal will stay consistent enough to get a message out. It's hard to believe it, but she was actually trying to apologize earlier. In her own weird way, of course. Part of me wanted to say I was sorry for what I said at the river about how she treats her family, but that would be lying. I'm not sorry for what I said. But I can tell when something hit hard and hurt more than I'm happy with. People dance around shit all the time when so much of this bullshit could have been avoided if people were just honest with each other. I roll down the window and prop my knees up on the dash, craning my neck some to peer at TJ in the mirror. He knows I'm watching him. Hell, I think everyone's watching him. 
Even with Socket Man as a cover story, him keeping silent about all this for so long is just cruel. Did he truly think not mentioning the fur color of the person who water with Sydney was for the best? Maybe he thought he could avoid a situation like this, our group getting shattered. Well, our group is fucked now. No way in hell I want to hang out with anyone but Carl after all this shit. And it wasn't like it was all peaches and gravy this past few years anyway. Chase, TJ, and Jenna hadn't so much as texted me since they left for college, and Leo used to visit me back at the warehouse when I packed freight. We fucked a couple times, but he seemed to get more and more disgusted with the arrangement. I couldn't tell if it was with me or him, but it was awkward as hell. I mean, I'm not the sentimental type, but when you're being screwed by somebody and they glance away when you look at them, it makes you feel like shit. I eventually had enough, told him I wasn't his fucking otter, and to get a flashlight like the rest of us. He cut me out of his life right then and there, and even stopped visiting Carl. It's shitty watching somebody who was once a social butterfly turn into an absolute recluse. For the first part of this week, he was trying so hard to act like his old self, but that nothing has changed. We were fags and weirdos in the middle of buttfuck nowhere. Of course we stuck together at first. But as Carl says, shit's broke now. As we make the turn off onto Margaret Street, I spot the familiar dust-covered plastic flamingos that adorn Auntie's yard. The manufactured house was built back in the 80s and still dons this sort of faded turquoise color scheme. She added these pink diamond-shaped bathroom tiles all around Ruth's edge a couple years ago too. For Halloween quiz for Halloween and Christmas, she hangs up neon-colored tube lighting, and I swear, you can see her house lit up from a mo from miles away. I'm not entirely sure what aesthetic she's going for. Carl called it vintage trailer trash once, and I guess that's fitting enough. Leo slows the van some as we approach. I don't see any lights on, no car in the driveway. She can't have parked in the garage. Shit's still packed full of boxes of uncle's stuff. Guys? Salamander pokes the glass of the window next to him, pointing at something across the street. That's, uh, Karen's place, right? Our old bus driver? It looks like somebody broke in. Is that recent? The colored glass of the front door is shattered. Piles of technicolor shards are splayed out across the concrete porch. Yeah, very. As in, it wasn't like this when I stopped by this morning. People are taking advantage of emergency services being out. I hope she's okay. Her car's not here either. They broke her statue too. The little sombrero chihuahua man statue which she had next to the door is completely shattered. It's smashed into a hundred pieces. The wooden Bienvenido sign that used to hang around its neck is split in half and laying in the dirt. Good. Jenna mumbles. I clutch my rifle a little tighter, trying to see if there's any movement going on inside the house. It's completely still beyond the light on the light swaying of pink lace curtains from the breeze outside. It's still probably best we speak with the mayor. Perhaps with what's going on, she returned to City Hall? My heart drops in my chest. Yeah, that makes sense. Hopefully the crazy guy is gone by now. Eh, I don't know. She doesn't usually work Saturdays. Jenna raises an eyebrow at me. Well, this is quite a Saturday, Flynn. Leo sighs, putting the van into gear. City Hall it is. It's well into the night by the time we pull into the gravel parking lot. Sure enough, Auntie's teal hatchback jeep is parked by the side of the building. Daxton squints at it, then points. A Dastra bumper sticker! On the chrome bumper, there's a decal of what I guess is a silhouette of Captain Amicus with some sort of insect on his face. Oh! Um... 
Did you want me to uh, catch you up real quick on all that happened? In golden spacey font, it reads, These things are harmless. Don't worry. I didn't know your aunt was cool. She's not. I grumble idly, my mind racing as I try to think of a distraction to keep everyone away from outside. Everyone but Carl and I are already getting off the van. Getting out of the van. The ram gives me a nervous look before nodding at me and speaking up. Dudes, wait a second. What? Leo's tone is curt as he looks back at the ram, who's sluggishly pulling himself outside. I, I feel like I'm going to be sick. Now? It's all that freeze-dried ice cream. It's so shitty, I can't handle it. Carl begins to make retching sounds, and Jenna quickly covers her ears. Oh god, Carl. Ugh, please don't throw up in my van, yeah? Um, guys? Carl continues to make some of the most visceral, gut-wrenching, erping sounds I've heard. They practically sound wet. Guys, we turn and see what TJ's trying to get our attention for. A whole bunch of cars are driving down the road in our direction, like a convoy. I recognize the one in front. It's Mark in his SUV. He works here at City Hall. They start to pull into the parking lot, it quickly, fill, it quickly filling up to the point where folks are starting to park on the road. What's going on? Here's my chance. That's Mark. Maybe he'll have some answers. I need to head inside real quick. I'll be back. I'll be right back. Jenna nods slightly, watching what looks like a bunch of townsfolk getting out of their cars in front of us. I pass the still hunched over Carl and give him a squeeze on the shoulder. Thanks. I feel like I'm actually going to puke now after that. Don't. I head inside. It's quiet when I enter, though I can hear the subtle sounds of shuffling paper coming from down the hall. I'm starting to feel this strange sort of pang in my head, like someone's pressing an ice pack to the front of my skull. Maybe it's because I'm nervous. Regardless, here I go. I walk lightly, peering around the corner into Auntie's office. Her fingers flick along various pages within a manila folder, her tropical flower print scarf swaying with her every movement. I watch her, illuminated only by the soft glow of the moonlight outside. I'm wrought with this uneasy sort of feeling where I can't tell if she actually knows I'm here or not, or whether she cares. It's a familiar feeling, but never one I quite got used to. There's a hell of a ruckus outside. You looking for something? Anything of substance regarding the whole hysteria business. She speaks plainly. What? I'll tell you in a second. Is Mark here yet? She cranes her neck to peer out the tiny slitted window in the corner of her office, yet there's not much of a view other than the side of a sagebrush. I saw him pulling up in his SUV outside with, like, a whole convoy of folk following him. This about Clint? She looks up, seeming to notice my repeater for the first time. Her brow furrows. You know, under any other circumstance, I'd give you a chewing out for bringing that inside. I did hear he's been making a hell of a scene around town, waving a gun around. Figured it was a meth binge until I saw Dale doing the same thing. Diner Dale? That fucking otter is kind of a softy, ain't he? You don't think it's got to do with his painkiller addiction? I popped four of the pills he takes earlier, you know, for the aches. It ain't the sort of thing to put you in a gunfighting mood. I nod. Despite everything she's telling me, I can't really focus on it. I keep looking back toward the closed reading room door behind me. Fuck. Might as well just get it over with. I take a deep breath. Did you let Chase out? What? She seems confused at the sudden change of topic. Chase. Leo's lover boy? Former lover boy. He hasn't been pounding on the door to get you. Boy, what are you talking about? I haven't seen him since you brought him in the Hendrix boy to City Hall the other afternoon. I turn moving out to the hallway and unlocking the reading room door. I always thought it was weird that it had a lock facing the hall, though I think Auntie mentioned there used to be a back exit through the here. What the hell? Flynn, what did you do? I ignore my aunt's exasperated voice as I push open the door, stepping into the dark room. It's mustier than a skunk's ass in here with all the rain damage. I can practically feel the mildew and mold on my toes as I run my hand along the wall. Eventually, I find the light switch. Chase? He's not in here? Carl's voice takes me by surprise, the ram standing slightly behind me. And of course, Daxton's there too. The salamander gu 
stopping at the interior like he's in some kind of museum. I can't believe you locked Chase up. Like, do city clerks have the authority to do that? Not unless he's, like, archiving him. You told him? I glare down at the ram, who quickly throws up the flat of his paws defensively. He's your roommate, dude. Come on. It's not like he's part of the old group anyway. Fortunately, like Carl said, I don't see the rest of the gang. Carl notices me peering past him and speaks up. They're, uh, talking with Mark outside. It's about time he showed up. Hi, Mayor. Hi. The two of them wave awkwardly. Auntie looks at the both of them with a sort of perplexed frown. Hello, y'all. She responds abruptly, quickly looking back up to me. Now Flynn. Just give me a sec. He's gotta still be in here. I see a stained blue v-neck shirt lying on the ground in the corner by the old bookshelves. Chase? Still no response. Instead, I notice there's something moving on his shirt. Little specks that seem to be gathering in the folds of the fabric. Oh, fuck me. I hold out my arm across the doorway, pushing Carl and Daxton back. Dude, what? Auntie, did Mark set off those bug bombs after work on Monday like I asked? I'm assuming by your tone that he did not. They hatched. Oh, goodness. Can we not play the pronoun game right now? What are you talking about? I see the unused can sitting unused can knocked over in the corner. Stay back, Black Widows. I lower my arm and walk over to it, quickly popping the top and watching the fogger begin to miss the foul-smelling fumigation spray to the air. The effect is near instant. The skittering pattern of little spiders begins to grow more erratic. I watch as an adult one on Chase's shirt clambers on top of an increasingly still pile of little spiders. It just sits there, writhing. I can feel something on my foot, too but my scales are far too thick for it to be of any threat to me. I hear Carl mutter behind me. I take back what I've always said. You do have balls. Excuse me? Er, sorry, Mayor Moore. Boys, I do not have the time for this. I fucking love Flynn's aunt. I fucking love her. Let me just delete this. Just remove it. Because it is not needed. As I look past the shelves, I see a big lump of fur curled up in the corner under one of the old metal desks. Oh fuck. Oh fuck. I dash over, grabbing at the otter scruff and yanking his ass out of there. He's surprisingly light and I realize I've never picked him up before. Oh damn, is he okay? Water. Gimme water. There's some in the mini fridge. I'll get it. As I pull him into better light, he looks like absolute shit. His lips are chapped bloody and the whites of his eyes are bloodshot. There's also dribbles of vomit on the floor, which I have the misfortune of stepping in. Vomit and spiders. Fucking great. Chase, wake the fuck up. I give his face a hard slap. Carl winces. The otter wheezes rapidly, letting out a kind of low moan. Man, he's terrified of spiders. I know. Karma, right? Graham speaks in an uneasy tone, visibly uncomfortable at seeing Chase like this. Yeah, maybe. Next thing I know, Auntie's handing me a bottle of water. I bring it to his lips. Drink, you stupid idiot. If this was a prank of yours, it ain't a real gut buster, Flynn. Move over, you're gonna drown him. I feel a weird tingle in the back of my neck. Reluctantly, I step aside. I look at Chase, and part of me hopes he never wakes up. And I feel sick. Why is he just in his britches? I blink, glancing down and getting an eyeful of Chase, Chase's briefs. You didn't undress him before you shoved him in there, right? Or was that part of it? Just fu- God, no! I didn't do that. Daxton gives me a dubious look before shifting his concerned gaze back to the otter. Auntie, meanwhile, is propping his head up, up on a couple office chair cushions, quietly urging the otter to drink as she wets his lips. They part for a moment, and Chase complies enough to get a swallow down. Again, part of me breathes a sigh of relief, while the other half seems to be filled with a sort of angry dread. Don't wake up. Daxton crouches down beside him pulling back some of the fur around his collarbone and showing the swelling red skin beneath. Must have been where he got bit. And of course, 911 ain't working. Carl chuckles nervously. I guess it's only too late to suck the venom out, right? You know that doesn't actually work. It's just dumb old westerns that made people believe that crap. Well, I had a great-grandpa, or great-great-grandpa, who died of a spider bite. I mean, I think it was a tarantula or something. Tarantulas ain't that venomous. He was old as hell, and there might have been, like, a fuckload of them. I don't know. Boys, this is real reassuring talk, but could one of y'all get me the first aid kits from the bathroom? It's just round the corner. 
Daxton stands up again and nods, heading off. Chase's eyes are fluttering a bit now. Maybe he's having a seizure, or dreaming something real crazy. He can't tell. The salamander returns, clutching the thick metal case that looks like it's from the 90s. Auntie takes it, opening it up and grabbing what she needs like she's done this a hundred times before. She applies the cold water to a piece of cloth and places it against the spot near Chase's neck where the bite is. Once it's stamped, she takes an old tube of antibiotic cream and squeezes out about a quarter of the contents on the bite spot, then lathers it in. Chase winces, letting out a quiet cry. Stop. His voice is high-pitched and kind of pathetic, like a child's. Oh, don't whine. You're a big boy. I'd be whining if I was in his position. It's kind of fitting, like Carl said, ain't it though? He looks to me, as if trying to gauge my expression. I'm managing to keep pretty stone-faced, despite everything. If he did what y'all are saying he did, I can tell the weird distance Carl and I are keeping from him, despite his sorry state, is unnerving the salamander. Just a couple hours ago, it was all figured we were old friends and such. Chase begins to sit up, and it's like my heart lurches. I get that feeling in my skull again, like brain freeze. No. No. Only Carl seems to notice as I clutch my temple, the ram giving me a nervous, concerned look. Finally, Chase looks to me. Flynn? Again, with a childlike voice. It's like he's taunting me. I suck in my lips. What the fuck am I supposed to say? I want to slap him again. I want the fucking truth. But he looks fucking pathetic. Everything's stiff. No kidding. You rolled in a darn black widow nest, kid. More interesting things to add to your little movie you're making of our fair town. And he sighs. I'm worried you'll have some more content here in a bit. What? What's- Ow! He seethes through his teeth as he clutches at his neck. What's going on? It reminds me of TJ, like he's about to start crying at a moment's notice or something. I haven't seen him like this in a long time. Carl's gaze shifts to the floor. I feel weird. Are you okay? Everything hurts, but it feels different. It's like this isn't a dream. It's not? I looked at Auntie. He's gonna be fine, right? These bites can be real painful. Could've been nastier with a brown recluse. But it still ain't gonna be fun. I'd get him to some professional help if I were you. If that's possible. I'm not gonna die? Chase peeps up, still clutching at his neck. Unless you're an infant, elderly, or allergic, it's doubtful. The otter closes his eyes, letting out a long exhale. Meanwhile, Auntie steps up, heading toward the door. I need to speak with Mark and see what he found. I'll be outside. Thanks. Mm -hmm. As she leaves, I can hear the rumble of engines and hushed murmurs from a small crowd. Then the door shuts and it's quiet again. What's wrong with you, Chase? I try to keep my voice steady, though my vocal cords shrill a bit as I say his name. I practiced for years to get rid of the girly, gay tinge my voice had after puberty. But times like this, I can't really hide it. Are you like, a fucking sociopath or something? Are you getting off to this? You just want to go home and come thinking about all the pain you caused? Daxton flinches. I can tell he wants to step in Chase's defense. Chase says nothing. I can understand screwing me over, you know? I originally figured you didn't give two shits about Sydney or what happened with to him. You just wanted my dick, and that's fine. You followed me back at the river because that's all you wanted. Leo and the rest of your friends be damned. But fuck, it was so much worse. Just admit it. Just say the words. No. What? Chase's arms and legs shake as he sits on the floor, craning his neck to look up at me. You're saying you didn't do it, despite what TJ said? He looks toward the door. You're an asshole, Flynn. He speaks, his voice still having that squeaky, prepubescent cadence to it. But Sydney was a friggin' evil idiot, and I'm glad he died. You're glad you killed him? I'm glad he died. That's no secret. Daxton, looking two parts tense and awkward, steps further away from the otter. Chase's eyes begin to well up. He looks so weak, but brimming with emotions. Salamander mutters something about checking on the commotion outside and heads outward. The noise from the parking lot is getting louder. I hadn't really noticed. Someone shouts about something, and I hear someone else speaking up quickly, trying to calm them. A long silence follows. 
Carl's like a statue beside the desk, unmoving, not daring to risk atten drawing attention to himself. Those last six months before it happened, it wasn't him anymore. Or at least, not fully him. What do you mean? You remember that one time he got Toby that ice cream cone from the corner shop in Peyton? The cactus-themed place that had the agave ice cream? I think that's how you pronounce it. A pause. It's a really specific thing that it takes me a moment to recall. It's also fucking strange hearing Chase call TJ Toby again. He teased him the whole car right up, and he was upset like usual. Sydney bought him that strawberry waffle cone scoop, the one with the pointy end. He felt guilty, I think, for a while. Toby was talking about Sunday school or something. TJ just took the stone, took the cone, and just started trying to stab him with the pointed end. He just crushed in on himself, but he wouldn't stop. Like, he was super into it. And he just acted like he was scared, not of getting punished or anything, but like, just in general, you know? I remember that. The shop manager was yelling at him, and he looked terrified. I told him not to worry about the townies. My teenage self thought it was hilarious. Do you remember the moment he decided to do that? The look on his face? It was like a... Chase clutches at his neck some more. He's got her clenching his eyes shut. The thing was in front of him. Chase gesticulates in front of his head, making a swirling motion before letting both of his arms droop limply on the ground. Jesus. It's like I just woke up from a really... from a really long, really bad dream. I haven't been myself in so friggin' long. Out of the corner of my vision, I can see Carl looking at me. The same shit that was happening to Sidney after what happened happened to you. But fuck, didn't see you do any of that shit until this week. I don't know, I just had bad dreams at first. Sometimes I see the stuff from the dreams in the real world. I kinda just numbed myself to it. And Leo helped me keep my mind off things, I guess. He looks over to Carl. Then we went to college, and it wasn't so bad. I stopped taking my medication, and things felt a little better, I guess. Not great. I was still all hollow, but at least I wasn't seeing the demented crap at the end of my bed anymore. Chase takes a drink from his water bottle, cringing at the pain from each gulp. I don't know what to say. I was beginning to think I was going nuts, think I was seeing shit that wasn't real, and hear him talk about it out loud. Just like Sydney. That weird look he'd have before looking upset or scared or doing some real heinous shit. And Chase was doing it while ordering fucking brunch. I'm sorry. Something's wrong with me. Or was. I don't know. Guess, uh, we can add that to the checklist of things to ask your aunt about. Chase begins to stand up groggily. What? The front door is pushed open. Jenna standing in the doorway. Guys, you should get out here. She spots Chase steadying himself against the desk, her eyes widening and her ears fl flicking back momentarily. Oh, Chase, you're here. And where are your clothes? There's spiders in them, Carl mutters. Okay, just get out here. Jenna heads back out. Chase pushes himself off the desk, beginning to walk forward like a zombie in one of those old VHS films we used to watch. Whoa, man, don't you have, like, some spare touristy shirts and stuff around here somewhere? Do you seriously think Echo gets enough tourists to justify merchandise? I just need to get back to the motel. Clinic first. The otter stumbles a bit, and though some hesitation, Carl and I take him by each shoulder and help him to the door. Now make sure to grab my rifle, though. You still didn't answer my question. Chase says nothing. We exit City Hall and are instantly greeted by a slew of faces. This is a load of fresh shit, you know that? What do you mean when you say we can't leave? Everyone seems to be gathered around the front entrance, the headlights from half a dozen cars lighting us up as we exit. Most eyes are on Auntie. The air has a sort of smoky tinge to it, like someone's cooking something. I wonder if it's from the fire I saw earlier. Y'all came here because you wanted answers. Now are you going to listen to them or not? I recognize most of the people in the crowd. Janice, Duke, Kudzu, Micah, Heather, Mark, and shit. I had a dozen more. Some of them looked downright terrified. Others, like Micah, clipped her shithead from Tetanus Alley, just looks pissed. Agitated by whatever the hell Auntie is saying. 
I can see Duke, the old widower who lives next to Leo, somewhere back by his car. He's not looking at my aunt anymore. He's fixated on Chase with this sort of thousands-yard stare. In the back of the crowd, I see the lumbering figure of Leo. At the side of us, he pushes his way through. Otter! Leo beams, wrapping Chase into his arms, seemingly uncaring that half the town is behind him. I see Chase's face contort, yada scream, yada grimacing. He was more disgusted than pain, especially as Leo begins to rub his large hands on his back so You didn't need to run, you know that. I'm here. Chase manages to wriggle free, nearly stumbling back into a prickly pair of tendons in the process. Leo catches him, holding onto his wrist. There are long moments where Leo is just looking at Chase's face, his expression shifting from a wide smile to a more vacant stare. I, uh, I got bit by a black widow. I'm okay now, but you grew your goatee back. That happened. What? Chase's eyes widen suddenly and clutches at the ratty looking tuft of dyed fur on his chin. It's a shame. I always thought you looked cuter without it. Dude, what the hell is happening? Carl speaks hushedly to me. All I can respond to, all I can respond with is an astonished shrug. Auntie begins to speak up again. Let's talk plain like. Most of you are seeing things, bad things, and some folk around here have started acting real strange, more so than the usual suspects on their bouts with the happy juice. And nobody's getting any tower or satellite signals for the phones and internet. Landlines fuzzy too. A couple of people nod. Mike is now looking over his shoulder, seemingly unfocused on what Andy is saying. Mark tried to head off to Peyton to see if the county officers knew what was going on. He got about as far as Flint to turn off before he found himself on the old Route 65 leading back into town. He tells me he tried three times to get through. No luck. Now, I would have slapped him on the head with a roll of newspaper and told him to take his clowning circus if I hadn't heard the same sort of thing from my grandpa decades ago. Folk traveling in buggies trying to escape the madness of this town got snared in one hell of a web. If you've been thinking your dreams have been getting real queer as of late, you ain't alone. It's been getting worse. Honestly, I was packing my bags to get out before it hit. I wasn't ready to leave. I remember telling Auntie I wanted to stay for Carl's interview, but I also wanted to see if I could get to the bottom of the shit with TJ too. So are you saying there's no way out? That we're in what? An inescapable bubble? Sweetheart, it's like the tide. It goes in, it's pulled out and sometimes it pulls stuff with it. My grandpa, God rest his soul, told me I was attracted to the uncouthness of man, the ires and desires with which we cannot unshackle ourselves. Simple sin. A mournful look crosses her face, and she takes a deep breath. Mark. She looks over to the horned toad, our town's treasurer. He's standing by his black four-door SUV. I always made fun of him for buying it. Black cars in the desert ain't a good mix unless you're keen on baking. He reaches into the cart and pulls out a lumpy something, wrapped in a flamboyantly covered beach towel. I recognize the faded logo in the corner as one from Southwestern Adventures. An old souvenir, maybe? Mark hurts as he steps forward in front of the mare with it, setting it on the ground. The first thing I see are the feet sticking out of the end. Someone in the back, Heather, I think, screams. It's a banshee-like wail as Mark pulls back the fabric. No! Keith! It's not Keith. At first, it's difficult to tell exactly what I'm looking at, but after a few moments, I can see clearly who it is. Don't show- Ah, fuck. Holy fuck. That is... Wow. I can't show that. At least I don't think I can. Holy shit. That's... That's Salem. Keith! Jesus. No! TJ begins to sob. His terrified sniffles mix with Heather's confused, shrilled cries. I don't know. Like, the file says, look what they did to my boar. And the first thing that came to mind was, look what they did to my boy. But, holy shit. Like, you can't see it, but, or something, I don't know. But it is, it is fucked. It is fucked beyond belief. TJ begins to sob, his terrified sniffles mixing with Heather, with Heather's confused, shrill cries. The boar is covered in lacerations, most of which are on his face. 
Two swipes of whatever cut him seemed to have torn his eyes and part of his snout out. I always thought when someone had their eyes taken out, they'd just be black holes inside. But it's pink. It's like I'm looking into this guy's brain. I feel like I'm gonna hurl. Holy shit. Holy shit, dude. That... That was horrifying. What happened to him? He tried to leave. Yeah, but how did that happen? Raccoon, who up to this point I've never seen as anything but the strong silent type, looks shaken up bad. He clutches his forehead with a paw, shaking his head. God, for a second he looked like he looked like somebody else. I barely know Salem. He's a recent move-in who originally squatted on vacant land in Narvi until the loan the landowner started making him pay to live there. He kept to himself, never even said two words to the guy. That's an accomplishment when you're stuck in town with just about 50 people still living here. Mark tells me that the third time he tried to leave, he just saw him lying there on the side of the road next to his RV, dead as a doorknob. So to answer your question, Coon Boy, I don't know. These things always end, but there's no clear definition of when or how. I advise as i do at all trying times turn to your to turn to the higher powers pray and repent as you may there's a shock there's a shock to silence from those present daxton keeps shaking his head jenna tries her phone again micah stares off into the darkness in the direction of the highway i know how to make the vision stop the weasel steps up to auntie though he's not looking at her yeah what's your proposal duke he points a pink finger toward chase we stop him Chase sort of half blinks, his bloodshot eyes aimed all unfocused up at the scruffy weasel. What? I can't discern who that voice came from. This has all happened before. He looks toward Auntie, who nods inquisitively. And it's only gonna get worse. It happened to my granddaddy, my daddy, and now it's happening to me. Well, me and the rest of yous. Dale's missing, Cynthia drove off into the desert, Clint and Jeremy are running around shooting and screaming at nothing. Thing is, We've all got something after us, something bad. Won't yet, won't let you leave when it starts. What's after you? The raspy voiced bat chimes in, still looking off into the desert away from the crowd. Duke's quiet for a moment, blowing a handmade cigarette between his thumb and index finger. It's always triggered by something. Duke begins to pace, still pointing at Chase. I seen you here last week before all the, before all the rest of your little friends showed up. Late at night outside his house. He nods in Leo's direction, dwarf clasping Chase's shoulder protectively. Just stand there. For hours and hours. I didn't even need to be asleep to see ya. That last line rings strange, Duke's saying it as if it makes perfect sense. Chase's gaze shifts to his feet, his legs beginning to tremble. Hey, I'm not saying you did it or that you were wanting this all to happen. He steps over to Salem's body, approaching the otter. It's just that you gotta know something, anything that we can use to stop this. Because anytime I ask big old Leo here, he's just got this glazed look in his eyes, telling me where I can stick my inquiries. Th that doesn't make sense. Well, uh, my, uh, something someone told me that you would know. It's at this point I see the black metallic shape sticking out the back of the weasel's trousers. He's got a gun. Daxton flinches, seeing it too. Oh shit. He mutters, and I feel Carl step closer against me. Who? Someone I know. He yells, leaning in closer to Chase. Leo steps in. Leo steps completely in front of him, ears down with his fangs bared. It makes sense. Something bad happens, and if you don't fix it, it won't stop coming after you. Leo lets out a deep guttural ramble, looking like Pharaoh ready to pounce. Duke holds up his paws, smiling uneasily. This is all real timely with your friends showing up. So, what happened, Chase? I don't know what you're talking about. Auntie exchanges a glance with Mark, and they both look to Chase, seemingly unconcerned that Duke is packing. Things are getting worse out here, and unless, we're, and unless we do something, we're all going to end up like young Salem. Duke's voice is dead and distant. He's right. Auntie's voice cuts through the air like a knife. Next thing I know, Bird and Mark are stepping up beside Duke. Flynn, come here. My heart lurches at hearing my name called, and I strain myself to keep a straight face. I try not to look at the body as I walk up, feeling the backside illuminated by a dozen headlights and the gaze of the crowd. You lock Chase in the reading room with all them spiders. Why? You what? 
didn't know about the spiders at the time. I mumble. Flynn? She looks away for a moment. Pretty sure he killed Sydney. I clutch my head, the blood in my veins feeling cold. It's as if the gravel beneath my feet is turning to quicksand. My mouth moves as if to say more, but I manage to bite my tongue. This just makes the pain worse. What the fuck is happening? I can see Jenna covering her face with both paws, seemingly in disbelief this is really happening. There's a few murmurs from the gathering. Michael looks back at us, seemingly distracted from whatever was in the desert Michael was staring at. You're talking about your little friend who drowned in the lake a decade ago? Yeah. Wow, kid. He clicks his tongue, shaking his head at the, the draggled look daughter. looking daughter. That's fucked up. Chase starts to look like TJ again, as if on the urge of breaking down into sobs. He seems to be alternating from angry, sad, and confused, over and over again. It's bullshit and you know it, Flynn. You killed Sydney, you fucker. The pain in flares, my vision blowing for a second. That's, that's not true. I highly doubt that, lover boy. I'll beat all of your asses if you keep telling lies, yeah? He grins, eyeing the rifle in my hands. I clutch it more tightly. Duke turns, thumbing toward the wolf. It's already got him. He speaks with such idle nonchalance, not bothering to clarify what it is. Sid died like ten years ago. This doesn't make any fucking sense. Well, this sort of murder happened before. My grandpappy lived through this whole thing and stayed in the town after. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Happened weeks after the body was found. Auntie rubs her thumb through her floral scarf, staring into the headlights of one of the old jeeps. The one in the mines. The air got all electric and fuzzy. Folk went out of their heads. She's never talked about any of this before. How do you know that? Brett gabbed about it a lot when you were a youngin, and even before you were born. Dad. The whole superstition was part of his justification for making like a library and booking it. Well, that and one other reason. I try to ignore the last comment, still focusing on the increasingly tense stare-down between Leo, Chase, and Duke. I had heard Mom and Dad hated Echo, mainly the usual rumblings about godlessness. Any ailments they had were surely the fucking results of some latent sin. The point is, the ground beneath our feet is a tainted soil. Rotten, shaky loam. Duke interrupts, but Auntie doesn't seem to mind. She's just frowning now, looking to the crowd of people. Her scarf's come undone due to all the fidgeting. All the old scars she had beneath are visible, tattered scales replaced with pink flesh. It's more rotten in some places, y'all know the ones. My grandpappy thought that because they didn't catch the murderer, they planted some seeds in the bad dirt. But that ain't true. Duke rubs at a scab along his forehead, squeaking, squeezing his cigarette so hard that the ash starts pouring out the other side like toothpaste. They caught him alright, but everything was okay for a while after they found him and he was killed. What the fuck does this have to do with Sydney? Duke continues, ignoring me. So I don't know what it is, if it's murder, guilt, or not catching someone that did wrong. I shake my head. I can't believe this shit. Sid's not fucking haunting the town you meth out. But it started when you got here, so you gotta forgive me for wondering if one of you did something bad. He was a fucking nine-year-old, and brought that guilt back to this poison land to grow the seeds again. Duke doesn't sound like himself at all, not even his recently crazed self. Still, I don't want to admit it, I start to have an idea of what Duke might be getting at, how this all fits into our history. And judging from the look on the gathered crowd's faces, the feeling appears mutual. There's murmured inquiries about what to do. Heather is still quietly sobbing, asking a group of people who ignore her why no one is helping Keith. Genevieve Sanders, a retired mail carrier from Peyton, mentions something about a lynching. Jenna's arms are crossed tight, her expression is sort of furrowed, indignant stare that slowly falters to upset confusion. TJ's next to her, one paw on her arm. Barry, I can barely hear him, but he keeps saying he's sorry over and over. Leo begins to tug at Chase, pulling him back in the direction of the van. The two begin hurriedly walking before Auntie speaks up. Stop! I always had this desire, this idea of getting justice for what happened. Sid deserved as much, and now I can't say I'm feeling any catharsis or joy. Just this hollow rumbling from my insides. This ain't right. This can't be how we fix shit. 
Chase has his head down now. Carl has his head down now. Graham acting small, despite his burly proportions. I just want to move beside him, tuck him under my arm, and fuck off far away from here. Get back over here. Leo clutches Chase tighter. The otter wincing as he struggles to wriggle free from the wolf. I, I can walk on my own, Leo. Leo seems to ignore both the mayor and Chase as they approach the van. Jenna quickly shoves her phone into her purse, the Fennec visibly trying not to look at the body as she, TJ, Carl, and Dax join them. Jesus. I rub up my aching head. Fuck this, I gotta get out of here. I hear clicking noise to my side. The horrible noise is deafening. I clutch the sides of my head and crouch down. A brass shell casing falls and hits my leg. It's hot. The dude's pointing his pistol into the air. Our group stops in our tracks, TJ falling to the ground and covering his face. Heather is shrieking, screaming over and over again. And then suddenly, she stops. There's some flailing of movement from the group that was standing near her, like the dancing you see at raves. When I look again, I can't see her anymore. Micah's gone too. Him and a few others scattered. I can faintly see the bat's silhouette in the distance, sprinting into the desert. What the fuck, Duke? I scream at the weasel. I needed to get their attention. For the mayor, yeah? That's no fucking excuse. That shot could come back down and kill somebody. Duke clutches the pistol with clean in his grasp, seemingly uncaring of where he's pointing the loaded weapon as he twirls his restraint. It's a bit late for that now. Folk have been hurt already. And they'll continue to get hurt till we stop this. I hear shouts of agreement from the remaining crowd. Auntie just nods and I can't help but give her a dumbfounded look. I clutch my repeater close. The spiders. The spiders got him. That right, Flynn? She points to Chase. Yeah, he sat in the nest of him. Duke. She holds up a finger, fast walking back into the office without another word. Duke watches our group by the van. Everyone's quiet. His pistol is aimed up at the sky. After a minute, she returns with a piece of faded paper clutched in her hands. There's some old-timey writing on both sides of it. She holds it up to Mark and Duke. Mark uses his cell phone as a light as they begin to read, Duke lowering his gun. I can see Jenna moving by the edge of the fan. She's motioning toward me, then Duke. What does she want me to do? Disarm him? One quick chop of the wrist. That'd do it, I guess. I'd have to drop my repeater, though. I don't really want to risk that. At least not yet. Surprisingly, Chase speaks up. What's it say? Boy, I think you know what it says. You were rooting through our stuff and plucking all these records Thursday. James Hendricks. Notice of death. Carl visibly stiffens. Guess what killed him? Spiders. I step up, squinting at the paper. It's a notice of death, all right, for reference in an S in a state transfer. It's for a James Hendricks who passed away in 1913. The cause of death is listed as poison infection, therifosode, therifosidae, spot, tarantula, tarantula. Chase shifts uncomfortably. Chase's ass got planted in some black widows. And what does Carl's gold great whatever have to do with this? James Hendricks, the first, was a notorious sodomite like Chase. Okay, I keep saying, I keep seeing that, and yeah, I don't know a lot. Hmm. I sigh. What? You say he was looking at this the other day? He's working on a school project. Hell, that's why he's here. So he claimed. You sure about that? Auntie seems to pry at my own niggling doubt. I look back at the pathetic looking otter. He looks to me. And then Daxton steps up. Hey, uh... He stops just short of the body on the ground. Daxton straightens his posture, folding his hands behind his back. Mr. Duke... I think you're making a lot of really interesting headway into how we can solve all this. You know, much better than just hiding out in our houses from rampant chaos and the like. But, uh, Salem here? He uneasily gestures towards the corpse on the towel, the, bear, the boar's hollow eye sockets still staring at the stars above. Whatever got him, I think stop and slash avoidin'. That should be priority number one. Because, I mean, I've only known Chase about half a week, and he doesn't seem like the sort to be capable of all this. 
kid. I've known Chase all my life, and I'd reckon something similar. But at the end of the day, Chase didn't do this, and it's what Chase... At the end of the day, Chase didn't do this. It's what Chase did that did this. This town needs justice. Hell, the old Sydney kid needs justice. I'm gonna save all y'all, and make it so she leaves me alone once and for all. Who? Who leaves you alone? Duke doesn't respond, instead raising his pistol. I can't tell who he's aiming at. His paw's shaky. I need to do something. Jesus, fuck. I... I mean, I don't have a choice. I stand there. I can see Jenna beside the van looking at me pleadingly. Auntie's peering at me now, a strange look on her face. This isn't right. I should do something. My head is killing me. Something's wrong. And at the worst possible fucking time, I grit my teeth, concentrating on what's really happening. Duke says something I can't quite make out, and Daxton stammers back a retort. I've had visions of Chase, too. Nothing that points towards that as a, as a conclusion. Leo slides Chase behind him, the wolf's ears pinned to the side of his head. Okay, should we trust Daxton or raise the repeater? Also, let me uh, Google something real quick. Sid's dad flashes in my mind. The hole in his head, the look in his eyes. I keep my rifle clutched across my chest, pointed downwards. Dax. Er, yeah? He's staring wide-eyed at the gun in Duke's grasp, his blue hands in the air. You gonna elaborate? Oh, yeah, um, hi. Dax does a sort of awkward wave before slowly lowering his hands. Jesus Christ. I'm sorry, I just, I don't think this is right. Perhaps we can perceive the guilt of others at... Fucking have to. If they're gonna play the fucking soundtrack or make references to it, I, I have to add them in the corner. Perhaps we can perceive the guilt of others at times in these sort of waking visions. You mention you see her. I don't. I, I don't presume to be knowing who her is. But it also sounds like you've got some baggage, too. You're testing me something fierce. Move, kid. Daxton flinches, and I gingerly take a few steps closer to the weasel. We, uh, needn't put all that out in the open with the details. I'm just saying, to assume that this is all caused by Chase here is perhaps overstating Chase's importance. And killing somebody, or even just letting them die, might just be fueling the madness at hand. In my dreams, the one with Chase in them, nobody's pointing towards some deep otherworldly call that he needs to perish. Even you, Miss Mayor, you can see the logic in that. Auntie stands with her hands on her hips, lips pursed. And what counters madness? Logic? Daxton smiles uneasily. Shoot them both! Someone in the crowd yells. I step over and smack Duke's wrists, with the gun falling to the gravel beneath. Next thing I know, Leo is sprinting across the gravel parking area. The wolf tackles the weasel to the ground, striking him in the jaw with a free fist. Mark and Auntie quickly try to pull him off. I scamper down to grab Duke's pistol before Leo does. Let me go! Let me go! We're leaving, Leo. Come on. Duke whinges on the ground, one of his snaggle teeth hanging from his lower lip. You doomed us, kid, and he's gonna get away with it. He stretches his mangy arm across the ground, pointing toward Chase. Auntie moves over beside me, resting her hand on my shoulder. Flynn, you can't make this decision for everyone. There's something wrong with you. I can't believe you entertained this fucking meth head's proposal. I used to think you were a good person, you know? But fuck that. Which trials it is. I spit on the ground. 
Auntie lowers her hand and begins to fidget with her scarf, her gaze shifting down, her gaze shifting down past. You used to think us Moors were immune to all this sordid business, but I don't think you are. Not anymore. Be careful, Flynn. She turns, walking back toward Mark, who is busy rewrapping Salem's body and bringing him inside. It's rare to see her look so uneasy, trying to run a shit town like Echo. You get a thick skin for shit crumbling around you, but nothing like this. Daxton quickly helps Chase into the van, and the rest of the gang follows. I basically have to drag him by the shirt to get him to come with, the wolf snarling and swearing in his native tongue the whole time. Sunday. <laughs> Excuse me, what the fuck? Hold the hell up. Hold up. Hold up. Hold up. What was that? Let, let me just pull up the files real quick and we will find out what that was. Also, I forgot to upload this. Before. I'm so sorry. I'll do that later. Why the fuck am I opening an Astra? Uh, Echo. Also, we are going to leave off here, by the way, because... Because, yeah. Uh, once I get it open, I'm just going to, like, share my screen so y'all can see and then leave. <laughs> okay. Excuse me, what? Let me just share my screen. Excuse me, mister. But I don't think you're supposed to be here. Bro, that was messed up. But anyways, uh, we made a shit ton of progress. I'm just gonna... <sighs> Holy shit. Okay. I think Chase was possessed. I think he's not possessed anymore and is like just living now or something. I don't know. Anyways, uh, stay safe and have a good night.